I want to start off with a bit of a scripture reading from Isaiah, because it has a bearing on what I'm going to be talking about from Ezekiel. In the year that the Tartan, the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it. At that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos, and God said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so going around stripped and barefoot. The King James says he went around naked and barefoot. Now, we probably are filled with horror at that thought, but uh, I'm quite used in India to seeing naked sadhus wandering around wearing nothing but a, a coat of ashes and maybe not even that. So it doesn't fill me with quite the same astonishment as it may fill you. Though I do feel very much for Isaiah if he went around stripped naked and barefoot because in winter it does get very cold in Jerusalem with quite a bit of snow. And then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone naked, stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portents against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away, stripped and barefoot, the Egyptian captives and the Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. And uh, that would indicate that it was indeed naked because prisoners, uh, nobody worried whether they were clothed or not. All right, and then just a, a very quick story. It's about a, a certain governor out in America, a British governor, I think he was, and he was talking to someone uh, in, in the street, in the city of Williamsburg. And uh, of course, at that time there was slavery and a, a slave happened to go past and he greeted Sir William, he said good morning to him. And Sir William immediately replied and wished him a good morning. And the other man said, Sir William, do you descend so far as to salute a slave? And why, yes, replied the governor, I cannot suffer a man of his condition to exceed me in good manners. <laughs> which was his excuse, but the main thing was he was treating other people as humans, as in that respect, equal to himself, something we need to remember to do, no matter where we are, no matter to whom we are talking. And then I'd like to share on that thought a song that uh, is one of my favorites, and uh, I hope that the video will be better because I'm talking from upstairs on my a desktop computer instead of using my laptop. Let's see how we go. It'll take a moment for it to learn. <laughs>
They'll know we are Christians by our love. Now, I want to talk about the silent prophet, which may seem a bit of a contradiction in terms. A prophet who can't speak or who doesn't speak seems, yes, a bit useless. But um, in the Nazi concentration camps, most people clung to life as long as they could, despite the cruelties of the Nazis. But a few, they, they just gave up. They became listless, apathetic, you couldn't rouse them. And for some reason, the term that was used, the slang term that was used in the camp for these people was Muslim, Muslim. And you even have a reference in the Wikipedia for Muslim. It was a derogatory term used among inmates of Nazi concentration camps to refer to those suffering from a combination of starvation and exhaustion and who were resigned to their impending death. Muslim inmates exhibited severe emaciation and physical weakness, an apathetic listlessness regarding their own fate, and unresponsiveness to their surroundings. Now remember that definition. Severe emaciation and weakness, apparent listlessness regarding their fate, and unresponsiveness to their surroundings. In Ezekiel, we have a, a lively young priest who one moment is going around well respected by everyone, apparently normal. And then he goes for a walk and he comes back and he sits down by the, by the fire. And for seven days, he doesn't say a thing to anyone. Just absolutely silent. And then at the end of that seven days, he's discovered, he's gone out into the desert again. He's discovered uh, still silent but exhibiting some very odd behavior now in order to understand the reason for what god was saying we need to understand the mind of the captives they were over here in babylonia somewhere jerusalem of course is here and uh, god wanted them to recognize their guilt and to turn back to him to rely on him but in fact they were pinning all their hopes on Egypt, that somehow the Egyptians would come and defeat the Babylonians so catastrophically that all the prisoners would be set free. And of course, they were encouraged in this by the false prophets that you had in Israel and indeed in the camp, where uh, the, these false prophets were saying, I, God says, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon within two years. You know, it'll all be over by Christmas sort of thing. <laughs> and when the true prophet of God, Jeremiah, sent a message to the people in Babylon saying, settle down there, uh, build your houses, you know, you're not coming back anytime soon, and seek the peace, the prosperity of Babylon. Boy, that caused a lot of uh, upset. That, that, were, that was not what the people wanted to hear. They wanted to hear that they were going home soon and that the wicked oppressors of Babylon would be defeated and destroyed. Well, God said to Ezekiel, take a brick and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Now, that may seem a quirky thing to do, but in fact, we have found in Mesopotamia maps. This is a map of uh, the city of Nippur, uh, sorry, of the city of Babylon. And you can see how it's engraved on a, on a clay tablet. Now, I don't know whether Ezekiel got some soft mud and engraved his city on it, or whether he got a brick. The bricks in Babylon were, were large square things. They weren't the oblongs that we have. And uh, he may well have actually built a model out of mud of the city of Jerusalem on, on, on this brick. And then God said, lay siege to it erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set camps against it, put battering rams around it. That's why I think it may have been a model. It wasn't just a, a drawing. And here's Ezekiel lying outside his hut. And as we'll see in a moment, he, he didn't move, just lying on one side, with this brick in front of him, silent, unresponsive. People would say, good morning, Ezekiel. Nothing, nothing. And as they pass by looking at this, you know, they think, oh, poor chap poor chap. He's a Muslim. He's just reliving the last days of the siege before he got carried off here to Babylon. Poor chap. Ah, oh dear. Nice guy while he lasted. Then God said, take an iron pan. Now, the only place he would get a pan that he, he could take would be from his wife. So it was probably his wife's 
best frying pan that he gets. He plonks the brick down in the middle of it. And God says, this is going to be a wall of iron around the city. You know, when you were besieged, you could hope that there'd be gaps in the besieging troops that you could sneak through and, and es escape from the city or bring in supplies or reinforcements. But no, God says there's going to be a wall of iron around Jerusalem. Nothing will get in or out. And God told him, lie on your left side, put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You're to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I've assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. Now you think about that. That's 13 months. For 13 months, Ezekiel had to lie on his left side. And even when that was finished, he had another six weeks to lie on his right side, outside his hut, unmoving. The only bit of brightness, if you want to call it that, was if someone came to him and, and said, well, what's going on, Ezekiel? Well, well, what's all this about? The Hebrew word naba, prophecy, is related to an... A uh, Babylonian word, a Cadian word, which means to rave, to jabber, to gabble. And anytime anyone came to Ezekiel and said, Ezekiel, what's going on? What, what are you doing with this brick? He would, his arm would come out from his, underneath his covering or his garment or whatever it was, and he would start to rave about the sins of Jerusalem, and the wickedness of the people there, and how God was going to bring disaster upon it. And boy, after a while, people shied clear from him. You know, sorry I asked, Ezekiel. <laughs> very odd chap. Very odd chap. Now, it's interesting that God says, I will tie you up with rope so that you cannot turn from one side to the other. You will be immobile. And um, that may seem odd. Some people say, it, oh, it's metaphorical, but I don't think it was. You know, when I lived in India, you'd go down the bazaar and from time to time, you'd see someone wandering around in the bazaar with, with chains on wrists and ankles, maybe just on his ankles. It was a mad person, someone who'd gone around the twist. And to stop them attacking other people and being violent, the, the community, the family would, would chain them up so they couldn't attack anyone or anyone could get away from them very easily. And I think this is what happened with Ezekiel. Remember, he was acting very oddly and people thought, well, you know, what are we going to do if he wanders off again? And so they tied him up. It may have been no more than a rope around his leg attached to a, uh, a stake or he may have been tied up hand and foot. I, I don't know, but he was restrained physically in some ways so that he couldn't get away. And then God said, take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, and use them to make bread for yourself. Weigh out 20 shekels of food. That's about eight ounces, or what's that, 230 grams of food? Now, let me tell you, ladies, if you want to lose weight, this is the diet for you. Eight ounces of food a day, eight ounces of, of this rather rough bread. You know, when we were in Canada a few years ago, there was people selling Ezekiel cereal. And it was a combination of all these grains. But Ezekiel wasn't using these grains as uh, a health food. They were just all that was available in a siege. You know, a little bit of a ration of bread and lentils and, and so on. Weigh out 20 seconds, eat it at set time. And then you're to measure out a cup and a half of water. And drink it at set, set time. Sip it throughout the day. And people would go past. And there's Ezekiel with his little slice of bread in his hand, half eaten, and his cup of water, half drunk. And people say, what's going on, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel's hand would come out and he'd start, oh, God is going to bring, uh, I'm showing you what it's going to be like in Jerusalem during the siege. And people would look at him as he got steadily more and more emaciated and the dried spit on his mouth and they would shudder and walk away. And God said, eat the food as you would a loaf of barley bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. Now, that word for fuel is just uh, an added in in the New International Version. <laughs> you don't find that in the King James. And some people think, well, was Ezekiel expected to eat human excrement? Well, no. I can remember when I was in India one day when I was a 
young lad, I, I don't know what, 14, 15, you know, hormones in overdrive. And my father had gone downtown. I'd gone with him, parked in the bazaar. And while my dad was off in the shops doing whatever it was, I was sitting in the car. And my eye was caught by this very attractive girl on the other side of the street, just sort of loitering around. And I, you know, like young men do, I was eyeing her up and uh, wondering how I could uh, somehow manage to get into conversation with her. And of course, also in the bazaar, there were sacred cows. And one of these jolly cows came past, lifted up its tail and deposited a load on the driveway. And instantly, the girl swooped down on this stuff and gathered it up in her bare hands and carried it off in triumph. Oh boy, I tell you, love has never died so fast. <laughs> Of course, I knew what she wanted it for. It was going to be used as fuel. And all over India, you can see these patty cakes of, of dried or drying cow dung. And they, they make it up into a ball, then slap it against whatever it is. And it's on walls, it's on trees. I, I noticed a telegraph pole there has escaped, but let me tell you, many of them don't. My father used to joke that he was afraid of leaving his car anywhere, or he'd come back and find it covered with patty cakes. So God told Ezekiel to use human dung as you would in a fuel in a siege where you were desperate for any kind of fuel and poor old ezekiel was shattered by this he said not so sovereign lord i've never defiled myself from my youth until now i've never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals no impure meat has ever entered my mouth you see ezekiel he could bear the physical discomforts that god had ordered but he couldn't bear the spiritual uncleanness. He was a priest. He couldn't come to God. He couldn't pray to God if he was unclean. And God relented and said, very well, I'll let you bake your bread over cow dung, which everybody does. And nobody thought anything of it. And so he could remain pure, even though that would lessen the impact of the parable. And then Ezekiel was told what this whole affair was intended to represent. Son of man, I'm about to cut off the food supply in Jerusalem. The people will eat rationed food in anxiety and drink rationed water in despair for food and water will be scarce. They will be appalled at the sight of each other, how skinny they become, skeletons in skin, and will waste away because of their sin. So Ezekiel the Muslim and his fellow prisoners fellow exiles must have thought, well, he's not long for this world, you know, poor chap. Nice guy while he lasted, but you know, I guess it can happen to anyone. And for 14 months, this carried on. And I want to say a word here, and as I will in other places as well, about Ezekiel's wife, who loyally stuck by her husband, even though she must have thought he'd gone round the twist. Who baked the bread? Who collected the dung if Ezekiel was tied up with ropes? Hmm. I think it was Mrs. Ezekiel and she must have cried herself to sleep many a night when he refused to eat the nice food she prepared and insisted on gnawing on his bit of dry bread and drinking his cup and a half of water. Well, at the end of the 14 months, the word of God comes to Ezekiel, son of man, take a sharp sword. Where exactly he would find a sword, I don't know. Maybe the, the word just means a, a big knife that you might use chopping up wood or digging in the garden. You know, the general purpose machete sort of thing. Take a sharp sword and use it as a barber's razor to shave your head and your beard. Now, I use an electric razor. I have once or twice tried using a cutthroat razor. And let me tell you, after my face finished up looking like a uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I was only too glad to get back to using my electric razor, I can tell you. That was using a proper razor. How would you get on if you're trying to do it with a big knife? Well, I imagine that when Ezekiel sat up finally after this 14 months, called for a knife and started to shave his matted hair and his beard, people started gathering. Hey, look, look what Ezekiel's doing. E Ezekiel's doing something. Look, Ezekiel, what are you? <laughs> Good gracious, look, hang on a moment. I'll go and get you a razor. And Ezekiel says, no, yeah. Just <sighs> the interesting thing is that when you finished a vow, a Nazarite finished a vow, for example, he had to shave himself, had to shave off all his hair and his beard. And then he had to take the hair and burn it on the altar in the, in the temple, in the tabernacle. And even down in New Testament times, you find 
St. Paul joining in this because when he was asked to show that he was still a good Jew, there were four men with us who made a vow, take these men, join in their purification rites, pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. All right. So God told Ezekiel to take this sword and shave his hair and beard and then take a set of scales and divide up the hair. I imagine that they were scales rather like this, two pans on a balance and you would put a, a weight on one side and whatever it was you were weighing on the other side, except that Ezekiel wasn't using a weight, he was using uh, hair. And of course it's very easy to divide something in half using scales, but to, to divide something in thirds, that, that's a, a bit more difficult. So Ezekiel was there for quite some time juggling bits of hair around from one pan to the other and uh, to the little pile on the ground. And, all this while, the crowd around him was getting more and more dense. And people are coming up and craning in the neck saying, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, it's Ezekiel. It's, oh, what's he doing? He's shaving his head with his order. Good gracious, what's he doing now? Oh, he's measuring it out, you know. And so he's got quite a crowd around him by this time, which, of course, was the purpose of the whole thing. And then God said, burn a third of the hair inside the city. This little model of a city on a brick sitting in its uh, iron pan burn a third of the hair inside the city. Then take a sword and strike, uh, take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city. And you can just imagine Ezekiel scattering this hair around in the dirt or outside the, the iron pan. Then he suddenly grabs at the knife and starts chop, 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 chopping away at it. And people are pressing backwards in case he hits their toes. Scatter a third to the wind and then pursue them with a drawn sword. I don't know which way the wind was blowing, but Ezekiel tosses his hair in the air, and then he suddenly picks up the sword and lets out a roar and chases after the hair. And boy, the crowd doesn't half scatter. And uh, again, more people are, are attracted by the noise. But take a few hairs, snatch them out of the air, tuck them away in the folds of your garment, but they're not safe there. Take a few of those and throw them into the fire in the middle of the city and burn them up. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Ezekiel proclaimed to the people who were gathered around staring at what he was doing. I myself am against you, Jerusalem, and I will inflict punishment on you in the sight of the nations. Because of all your idols, I will do to you what I have never done before and will never do again. In your midst, parents will eat their children. Children will eat their parents. I will inflict punishment on you and will scatter all your survivors to the four winds. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will shave you. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls. And a third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. What Ezekiel did with his hair mirrored the fate of Jerusalem. But now that he could go around again, Ezekiel was free to wander around the camp. And no doubt he was only too glad to get a bit of exercise, limber up his limbs a bit. But God said to him, as you go around, you're to clap your hands and cry out, alas, because of all the wicked and detestable practices of the people of Israel. So there you are, minding your own business, cooking outside your hut or engaging a bit of bartering in the market, and suddenly you hear this clap behind you, and alas, because you turn around, oh, good gracious, <laughs> you gave me a fright, Ezekiel. What, what's that you say? But as well as that, Ezekiel was told to compose some songs and start singing them as he wandered around the camp. Now, they don't sound terribly catchy, not like the songs that Steve produces for us to sing in the service, but perhaps they sound better in... Hebrew, perhaps they're more catchy in the Hebrew, and of course we don't know what tune Ezekiel had. No doubt it was something horrible in Eastern. There's nothing worse than Arabic music nonstop, I can tell you. Perhaps it was sort of an earworm in the Hebrew. And people, once they got the, the words and the melody in their ears, they, they, they couldn't get rid of them. It kept going round and round, reminding them of the message that God wanted to give them. I will judge you according to your conduct. I will repay you for your detestable deeds. I will repay you for your conduct, and then you will know that I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. It was a message that the people could not forget. 
Ezekiel had refused to speak God's words for seven days. But you know, like Jonah, Ezekiel could not get away from the calling to which God had called him. Jonah tried to flee and was brought back by a whale, and he ended up in Nineveh, proclaiming the message God had given him. God gave Ezekiel a message, and for seven days he refused to give it. He couldn't bring himself to give this unpopular message, and so God said, all right, but you are going to give my message anyway. You may not speak it, but you will be the message. Ezekiel, the Muslim, the living messenger for God. So let's just bow our heads for the benediction, our Heavenly Father. We thank Thee for the prophets of old. And we pray that the blessing of God, the Father, the love of Christ, the Son, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit may be with us all till He come. Amen.